Welcome to today's show. We have a great guest here. Today we have Oswald. Oswald Nkengulu Kimana. My last name is very long, only 16 <laughs> letters. Well, I appreciate that. Thanks for Thank being you. on today. Um, Oswald, actually, I really wanted to have you on because just a couple weeks ago, we just passed each other in Good Your Branch, and you mentioned that you were working with refugees, and I just thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, tell me a little bit, what got you into the business, and, and why is that your niche? So, um, for me, I was in nursing school, and uh, one of the uh, friend I had in my, my class, they wanted to, they, they mentioned real estate, like you should become a real estate agent. So even though I had bought a house before that, uh, they told me you can, you can help people, you can help people in different ways. So they were cool. So I, right, right there and then I made a decision, I started researching like the school to, for real estate, how long it's gonna take and what do they do. And I realized that there's a, a group of refugees in, in, a, in a state in a state that definitely need help, that don't have the education or the scale to own the properties. That makes sense. So what, um, what was it about the, that particular Refugee. community that, that made you want to help them? So I myself was a refugee for five years in Tanzania. I uh, came, came to America when I was 14. And uh, even though I've been here for 22 years, even though I grew up in Arizona, I still didn't know the, pro I did not know the process of purchasing a home. Um, in my country, there's no such thing as going to the bank and getting a loan um, unless you have something to trade with. So they don't just give you a loan like here. There's no credit card. So if you have, if you want to buy a property, you just, you just pay cash. So many of the refugee community, when they come here, they don't understand it. They think that in America it works the same way and it's not the same saving $300,000 <laughs> to buy a house. So that's why I decided that. When I found out that that was a thing, that people, when I purchased a home myself, I realized that there was more people that need to, that need help with that. So I, I figured I can help them. And that's why that's it became awesome. my niche. Well, I think it's interesting. Um, you say you left nursing school yep. to, you just quit, quit and yep. just jump full time into this. Um, tell me, what was the thought of you going to nursing school? Was it an easy path, or what was that for you? It was not easy by any means. I worked uh, in a hospital for 11 and a half years. I started off as a transport. I worked as a PCT, CNA. I worked every single position there was. While, um, I was taking part-time classes because I'm also a dad. I have two kids. So I was taking classes here and there part-time. And then now uh, the nursing school, they had a, a waiting program. So I liked the patient care. I like caring for patients, uh, for people in general. Um, so that's why I was going for nursing. And um, also it's a stable job. So I was looking for stability at that time. But um, when I found out I can do more than what I was doing, because for me becoming an agent was like, you can do more than what you're doing. I literally took the jump. That makes sense. So there is no stability in, in real estate? Uh, not, not as stable? Real estate is a different, uh, you have to be a hard worker already. Like, you have to already have the work ethic uh, because you don't get a paycheck every two weeks. So, like, my first year, the whole year, I only closed two houses. So, that's what, about 11,000? <laughs> so, therefore, um, that's not enough for the whole year. So, if you spend, if you don't have the work ethic already, you're not going to get up in the morning. You're, not, you're gonna come home whenever you feel like it. But for me, I, I always worked since I was 16. So therefore, when I know there's a, a bigger goal, something I can achieve, I go for it. Awesome, I appreciate that. Yeah, sometimes we, and I get agents who get in, they're like, I'm free, I can choose my own, but they forget about that, you gotta work. This is a business, it's your own business, for sure. There's no such a thing, yeah, I don't think, there's no such a thing as uh, working for your own. You always work for somebody, because even if you, even if you, uh, you still need a client, and that if you don't get a client, you don't get paid. So therefore, you're not working for your own, you're working for somebody. For me, I don't see it as a work, I don't see it as a job, I see it as improving people's lives. And so that's why I do what I do. So I do it with a big old smile, I'm always excited. I do it because every single client I'm helping, um, I'm improving their life. Makes sense, cool, I appreciate yeah. that. Tell me, um, you say you've been working since you were 16. Yep. Um, tell me what was, what was it like for you as a kid and what inspired you? What, what was, what did adulthood look like for you? As a kid, because like I said, I came here to America when I was 14. I did not speak a word of English. I spoke Kirundi, Kinyarwanda, Swahili, um, 
some French at that time. I studied French when I was in Africa, uh, back in the refugee camp for a little bit. Um, but English was not one of them. So one of the struggles I had was English. So my first job actually was uh, I worked at, um, at the, I would go to the Swamid and uh, I would help people like roll stuff in the car and unroll it afterwards and they would pay me like $50 or whatever it was at that time. Um, and then my first real job, W2 job, was uh, I worked um, at Food City, uh, putting food in the bag when I was uh, 16. Mm -hmm. um, but when I came to America, it was a different country because this country, you can literally become any, anyone you want to be. The only problem is they don't tell you is there's so many people tell you that they, they put the uh, failure on you. People put failures. Whatever they couldn't do, they say that you're not going to be able to do it either. And us as people, we choose to accept what people are putting. Uh, the, the, the failure for other people, we put it on us, and we don't go as far as we should have went. That's, a, that's, that's very true. So what did you do to overcome those, I guess, those barriers that... In the beginning, I didn't know. Like, that's why I, I spent so many years working regular jobs. Not that regular job is a bad thing to do regular yeah. jobs because everybody has a calling. Um, but in the beginning, I, I was searching for more. Like, I would talk to people, like nurses. I would talk to nurses. I would talk to doctors. I would talk to radiologists. I would talk, because I was in the hospital field, I would talk to, like, different people and ask them, uh, like, what do you like about your job? What do you see, like, 10 years, what do you see yourself 10 years? What don't you like about your job? So I, will, I was literally going around in the different businesses, like, asking people um, and creating friends at, at the same time, asking people, like, what they like about their jobs. But I never met a real estate agent. Even my realtor that helped me buy a house, um, I never keep in touch with him or he never keep in touch with me. So I never actually ask him, like, what do you like about your job? How does it work? How does that work? But I, got, uh, I met this guy, um, and one of the nurses. He actually was going to school for a radiologist, but uh, then he decided to become a nurse. Um, he's the one that got, he introduced me to a book called uh, Fast Learning Millionaire okay. with the, uh, Marco, uh, MJ DeMarco. And that was the first successful book I ever read. And when I started reading it, it was describing literally like the lane, like different lane in life you mm -hmm. have. And it kind of got me thinking like, which lane am I in? So where do I need to be? And why is it important for me to get there? Because some people can say, I want to be rich. But once you become rich, what are you going to do when you get there? Right. The thing is, it's not about rich. It's about the people. Being broke, you're not helping anybody. Right. But when you become rich, you can help more people. I like that. I so, like Jim Rohn talks about that. It isn't about the million that you make. It's about what you need to become to right. be a millionaire. Right. So I like that. Exactly. Appreciate that. Tell me, uh, you, sp you talked about um, having a job uh, at 16 at the store and... Uh, 14 helping people at the swap meet, but what would be the most unique way you've ever had to to make a living? What did you have to do? Um, so I, like I said, I was worked. For me, I never had a difficult finding a job, because for me, I never take a no as an answer. Um, I mean, I will get no. Of course, everybody gets no. But when I go, when I when you say no, I'm looking for that one yes. Because one thing, one thing I realized in life is this. Um, one, one of the biggest, there's three things I realized in life. One, it was um, don't take failures from other people. If people fail, it doesn't mean you can fail too. Don't let people determine where you can, where you can be, where you can go, what you can achieve. So don't let anybody determine that. You determine that for yourself. That was one. Number two, don't be stingy or don't be selfish. That means if you have an idea, Sometimes those ideas are not for you, they're for somebody else to for fear, but they came to you so you can tell that person. So everybody, my, my vision, my dream is for everybody to become rich. Why do I say that? Um, rich for you may be like $10 million, rich for me may be $50, right? right? It doesn't matter, like, but rich like, to a place where you feel like I fulfill my, 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 my life. So to me, being rich and being successful, it's like breathing air. Like, if I'm breathing the same way, it's not preventing you from breathing it. Right. So it is actually better for more people to be successful because we can make better changes right. in life. So for me, like the, one of the unique jobs, I just basically work in the hospital was, uh, I would say that was like the most unique thing I, I did because um, I got to meet a lot of different people from a different part of the world, especially when I worked in your ICU. That's so. awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, just trying to think about what it was like for you um, in the 
in the camps. Um, and, you know, going to sleep every night, waking up, trying to have hope. What, what kept you motivated? What kept you going and, and um, wanting to learn even? <laughs> to be honest, there's no such a thing as being motivated in a camp. Okay. <laughs> and the reason why I said that is because uh, I don't know if you guys, many people um, know about the Hotel Rwanda because right. that's the, exp the war experience many people have. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Hotel Rwanda was the movie based on Hutu and Tutsi the war, that were fighting against each other in, in Rwanda. So my mom is Hutu and my dad is Tutsi. Mm -hmm. So what, what that is, it's more like, uh, imagine like you being born by a black father and a, a, a white mother, mm -hmm. and then the black and white people are fighting against each other, right? That's how it was. So the Hutu and Tutsi were killing against each other. So therefore, for me, because my mom was one tribe and my daddy was one tribe, I can never go back to that country. Mm. So um, when we went to refugee camp, before we got to reg refugee camp, I spent, we spent about nine months in prison. Uh, because the prison was the safest place for us, otherwise they were going to kill us. Wow. Or because um, uh, my parents were the two tribes that were basically killing each other, and my parents did not want to separate. During the war, a lot of people separate. Like, they got divorced, and a lot of people betray each other too, like they actually kill each other. Wow. Or they kill the kids, literally that's wow. how it was. So finally, in 1994, they opened a, Tanzania, they opened a refugee camp called Mukugwa. That was for people like us who were mixed and we never go anywhere. 1996, the American government, the uh, Canadian, Australian, and some of the European governments too, they came and uh, they, uh, the UN, they came and got together and say, these people can never go back. They don't have a country. Any of you, like they basically say, we, our country is willing to accept you guys, like basically bringing refugees. And uh, so we applied, my, parent, my, my dad of course applied, we went through a long um, process. But um, we didn't know what America was going to be like, but we didn't care because I can never, there was no hope. Like, you can never go back. What am I even going to school for? I can never go back. There's no country for me. I'm a refugee. I can't go out. So there's no, there was no hope. Many people die, even the refugee camp, because if you didn't get killed by the disease, you will get killed by your neighbor. <laughs> wow. So life was, life was, um, um, I don't even know how to describe it, to be honest, but there was no, I didn't have a dream, so I didn't have a vision, because I for sure knew that I was not going to turn 15. I was going to die before I was 15, so. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, you know, it's, I grew up in America, and I, I just assumed that I had a pretty bad war. I grew up in America, mm -hmm. but, you know, realizing that there's people in the world who have, have tougher times than, than we do is just a great responsibility and reminder that we are blessed and Absolutely. We should, we should accept that as a as blessing. So I appreciate you sharing that. You. Um, so just, I guess maybe one final question is kind of about your parents and how they, if they talked to you about that or if you saw that, how did you, uh, how did they get through that when other, other families just decided to walk away and how did that affect you? So my mom, actually my mom was, my mom was much, well they both were much, much stronger. But my mom said when I married him, I knew what tribe he was. So it was a nice surprise to me. So if w he's going to die, then we're all going to die. Basically, that's what my mom said. And my dad was like, okay, well, if we're going to die, we're all going to die together. That's just how it is. And um, so for us kids, they're trying to protect us, which when I gr as I grow older, I, um, it became an issue because I was debating with the issue, like why would somebody, I could not understand why somebody would hate you because of who your mom or your dad is. I could not understand that concept. So I, I started hating myself for, for a while. Even when I came to America, I was dealing with uh, self-esteem issues, hating myself that I'm not good enough. But the thing is, it's like, um, you're not good enough for who? Who are you comparing to? Because everybody's unique, everybody's different. So who are you comparing yourself to? Because you can never fit somebody's shoes that's not yours. Right. So um, my parents, they try to keep it a secret, but like we knew, everybody knew we were different. But they're trying to like, the best like don't talk about tribalism don't talk about it or uh if you talk about it don't um like don't don't hate there was a love everybody but how do i love somebody that's hating me like it was difficult it was yeah. it was very challenging that is that's the challenge for you know many people how yeah. do you how do you show love in that situation so but you do by loving yourself mm, i like that 
you do you do that by loving yourself because the thing is what i realized what i have learned i'm 36 years old but what i have learned in life is this um people hate you because they hate themselves but they you happen to be the person there so they can put that on you and that's why you should happen so that's what hate is the person hates themselves so much that they cannot leave to see somebody else doing better than them because haters are not at the top they're on the bottom and there's the reason why they're on the bottom. Right. So. I appreciate that. Well, I appreciate you spending some time speaking with us today. Um, I don't have any last words. You want? You have any last things you'd like to say and leave with the leave with the audience? Um, I'm gonna say thank you so much for um, inviting me to this. Uh, this was very exciting, and I'm looking forward to help as many people as possible. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. It.